All right, great. Thanks, everyone, for holding on. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Megan Lenz. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for CureSMA, um, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. Um, I also have with me Kenneth Hobby, who is the President of CureSMA, Jill Jarecki, who is our Chief Scientific Officer, and then Mary Schroth, who is our Chief Medical Officer. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. We will be uh, sending out the slide deck after this webinar, so you'll receive that via email, and then we'll also be posting the slide deck and the recording of this webinar uh, on our news section sometime next week. Um, so please look out for that. If you miss anything or if you have um, you know, friends or family who are not able to join us, they will be able um, to review the material next week. Um, I do also want to remind you that this uh, is for U.S. audiences only. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You should have a question box probably on the right side or top of our screen. So feel free to submit your questions um, as our panelists are going through their presentations. Um, you should right now be seeing a screen that is mostly purple. It says SMA Treatment Access and Clinical Trials Webinar. If you're not seeing that, please go ahead and send us a chat and we'll try to troubleshoot that for you. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kenneth Hobby, our first presenter of the day. So the topics that I'm going to mostly focus on are about treatment access, and I think they're also about kind of the, the much broader, bigger picture. I'm going to give an update of where things really stand across the whole U.S. in terms of access to treatment. I think the reason we do this is to try to allow everybody to see for your individual cases where you compare with other people, other groups, other areas of the country. And also to help try and you know set the right expectations so you can see how things are progressing, what timelines are, and things like that. So that, that's the reason we give this high-level overview. We're also going to have uh, Megan talk about some resources that can help you more practically after this webinar and moving forward. Jill is going to touch on the other side of what's happening right now. It's not just treatment access, but it's the clinical trials that are going on. Those specifically, but also how that is related to, to current questions on options on treatment. So we're going to touch on some of those topics. And then Mary's on as well about the, the aspects of care that are still very important and will be important in the future as well. So to start off with, uh, just giving a snapshot of where things stand right now. And again, this is just in the US. We think there's probably about um, 1,900 patients in the US that are actually getting dosed right now. And that's everybody that's on the commercial programs, the support programs, and people that are in some of the extension trials as well that are going on. And so that's probably around somewhere between 20 and 30% of everybody who's affected by SMA in the US. Now, not everybody's gonna to want to be on therapy in the end, but that's kind of where we currently stand out of everybody, about 20, 30% currently getting dosed. Um, I think what we've seen overall is that things have been going definitely in the right direction. There's a chart on this slide that shows we've started off in the end of 2016 with nobody basically getting the approved treatment to where we stand now. And it's been going up at a, a steady rate, a good kind of increase there. We want to see that definitely continuing at the same rate as we go forward now. And maybe if we can, even kind of increasing the, the numbers that get on um, every quarter as we're into 2018 as well. What I'm going to touch on are really kind of the two areas that we focused on, which are barriers, um, issues, the things that we had to work on to allow everybody to get access to the treatment. And it really breaks down in terms of the sites that are available, hospital sites that are available, ready to dose. And then the other side is the, the insurance, the coverage for the payments for the actual therapy as well. So to start off with on the site angle, this actually is an area which I think we've seen a lot of increases, probably faster than we would have expected, where right now we think we've got just over probably about 215 hospitals in the US who are dosing. And so what we can also look at is that on average, then that, that means that our, those hospitals are seeing an average of almost 10 patients getting dosed right now. What we are actually seeing though behind the scenes is not that average, and this is something that we'll get into more detail on. What we see is a mix of some sites, and these are the known sites, the experienced sites, who are dosing an awful lot of patients. Some of those are kind of in the range even of 50 to 100 patients. Then we have actually the vast majority of the rest of these sites who are dosing right now who are only probably seeing one or two patients. And I think that's the area for us where 
we think things are looking good, but we know we've got kind of an area to focus on. And it's those sites that only have a few patients right now that are getting dosed. In all, we've got about 275 sites, and these are the ones that are dosing, um, but also ones that are interested in the future in getting involved. So that 275 is really what we think probably the total number that we're actually going to need ultimately, eventually when they're all up and running, actually dosing patients. So we're good with kind of that, that big volume. So on the next slide, it gets into a little more detail on these sites. I think overall the summary again would be that we, we're doing good right now in getting the attention and the interest of all the hospitals that we're gonna need. And a lot of them are actually being active right now as well in that dosing. So we have on our website, and we've been talking about this, a list of sites who are dosing right now. And that's a publicly available list for, for patients, families to contact. The way I think we look at those sites, and there's about 118 on there right now, is those are the sites that are now ready to accept new patients as well. So they, they've got their own list, they've been dosing some patients, and they're now ready for new patients to come in and contact them. So those, those are really good. They're kind of the ready to, to ramp up um, their operations. So that's about 118. That obviously leaves us with about 100 who are dosing, but are not ready yet to be public to accept a lot of new people come, kind of coming in. And I think that shows this group of hospitals and sites that we're really focused on, where they're really just kind of testing out the waters. They, they're brand new probably to SMA treatment and knowing about SMA care, um, working with SMA patients and a new therapy and kind of figuring out all the processes that have to go along with that with paperwork, coding, insurance. So what we think is there's a really big bulk of hospitals who are probably only dosing one or two, three patients. And that's our focus actually going forward. That's the group that we now have to focus on getting up to probably not the big numbers of the known sites, the 50 to 100, but if we can get them up to 30, we'll have all the hospitals that we need to, to be dosing everybody in the US. Um, so I think, again, this is a picture on, on, the, on the sites We've gone from the sites that knew SMA very well that were doing the clinical trials, who were you know, the, the really knowledgeable sites on how to treat and how to care for SMA patients. Those are the sites that we think are really ramped up now. We've actually done some funding to those sites to kind of really help them with, with more than anything else, just kind of paperwork and admin to get as many patients through to those sites as needed. But what we need now is these additional 250 sites to really get ramped up. Um, what we are actually doing with them is kind of an approach. We've done a lot of education and awareness with them to get them interested. And now we're kind of helping them with training and support. And I think really key thing, bringing them into our community. This is the model that we've had. And so we are doing activities with webinars, um, Mary, some of the other uh, group um, groups here are working to kind of really kind of educate these hospitals on SMA. But also we're doing a new clinical conference inside the annual conference where we'll be inviting these, these healthcare professionals these new hospitals and sites to come into our community. And we're really hoping that'll have that impact on bulking these hospitals up, getting them comfortable with taking on many more patients. So the next slide and, and shifting focus here now to the other issue on access, which is the insurance part, the coverage. So I know this is a very busy slide. We're not gonna stay focused on this for too long. It will be available on the website as part of the materials afterwards. But this is more a visual representation though to kind of show a picture of where we currently are with access, coverage, and restrictions from both commercial and Medicaid public policies that are out there. So a few things just to highlight to start off with, we actually have a really good number of these public policies now. Um, I think up to, it's about 36 here, again, commercial and Medicaid. And that's a good sign we're getting public policies. It also gives us now the chance to compare groups, to be able to kind of see how things are looking across this full data set, and each row here is a public policy, across the top of the criteria that we're focused on, that we have the FDA label, which is coverage for all SMA, and so that's all types, one, two, three, and four. That's all copy numbers, and those are highlighted on here as well, one, two, three, four copy numbers of SMN2, pediatric and adult, and then some other kind of aspects of, of, of SMA care as well. So when we now can kind of look at this sheet we've now highlighted the areas in red. These are the ones that we have the restrictions on. I think overall the message is it's actually good and it's changed over the last year to getting more of the yellow, which is covered, um, included in policies. And so now we've highlighted the red, which are the ones that now we need to focus on. We need to make sure that we're getting really yellow across the board, 
but it allows us to kind of focus on the areas now where we've got more restrictions there than we'd like. We'll go to the next slide, but again, this slide will be available for, for everybody to kind of look at later on. What this really does, I think, allow you individuals, patients and families to do, and us as well, is to look where you are, your commercial kind of coverage, if you're in a particular state, how your um, provider, your payer is going to compare against other programs that we've got across the country. And so what we're really able to do now is say where a particular policy is, is, is out of the norm, that we can look across and say we have pretty good coverage in type ones, type twos. And if we see a policy that doesn't meet that, where 90% of the policies do, we're really able to kind of focus down a lot of effort on those particular policies and, and push them to open up their, their coverage as well. So the summary here, when we kind of look across all these 36 policies that are out there, is that we have actually very good coverage. We look at almost about 90% of those 36 programs covering for type ones, two and three, and the two and three copies of SMN2 and also the pediatric age. Then we have kind of a middle tier where they're in the right direction. They're, they're not where we ideally want them yet, but, but they're at least in kind of moving in the right direction. And so these are the ones that we want to kind of keep advocating with to, to open up. And so this is when we're looking at the criteria of one and four copies of SMN2, adults, and then also where we have kind of the trait and the non-invasive restrictions as well. They're, they're not as good as for the other types that I was talking about, but they're in the right direction at least. Where we really kind of focus down is, and this is where we've got the reds on the other slide, where we see restrictions that, that really are not the norm, that they're not, uh, when you look across at the other kind of policies, commercially and states, lining up with what other groups have done. And so that's where there's restrictions in place for type zero and type four. And in particular, Medicaid states as well, a few stand out is really below the average for, from other places. And, you know, I'll point something out. This is Illinois. Illinois is actually the worst state for their Medicaid coverage decisions across the criteria. And as a comparison, and this lets us put pressure on them, they're only covering 31% of the criteria that we have compared to on average 80% for all the other states. So that allows us to advocate, it allows us to push, it allows us to say we have a good precedent now where if you're a state or a program that's not matching up with our average, we can push against them. We know though that there's some additional work in, in addition to advocacy that we've got to focus on, and that's where we do need more data. We know there's certain areas where more data is needed to support the argument of coverage. Even though that we have the FDA label, payers are looking for some additional information as well. There was a publication that came out which was one of these pieces um, last night, and we got a link this morning with the Cherish data, which was the phase three control trial that result is now out there and published. And so that can be used to support coverage um, for kind of that uh, older age range that were included in that, in that trial as well. There are areas which were not in the trials and, and so it's not existing data to get published where studies, new real world data needs to be collected so that we can kind of push for, for more coverage as well. And so we know that that's really in the adult group and also where we have patients with fusion and, and we need to kind of look at the devices that are going to be needed to, to help support coverage there as well. So on the next slide, we're focused also on the other area. So commercial, Medicaid, but also Medicare is, is going to be heavily involved for us as well. They're in a bit of a different kind of process of how they get their policies together compared to the, the other groups, which almost start at a national level and then filter down. Medicare does it almost opposite where they let things bubble up from the local level, regional to national. And things have started to move there. We actually had um, a draft policy that came out from one of their big regional groups. I'm not sure the exact number of states that covered. It might have been around eight states. Um, and so we were involved there. Mary was on advocating and, and you know, we're commenting and pushing and doing our advocacy efforts there to now get the policies out for Medicare coverage as well. So the final slide that um, I'll focus on here is what is the next stage as well. So I think when we look at where we stand right now with sites getting up and running, the coverage that we, we're seeing policies on, we think we're probably winning the battle in terms of getting people onto therapy to start off with. There's definitely um, the next wave that we're looking for with those sites to open up from just doing a few patients to doing 30 patients. That's the next wave that we hope will kick in pretty soon. But after that, it's not just about getting patients onto therapy, it's about the renewals, the reauthorizations that are going to come through. 
And so there's a few things that we've been pointing out and that we're working on as well, which is making sure that enough time is being given for the drug to actually work. And this is both for expectations for everybody in the community, but also with hospitals and with insurers especially. This isn't something that works just in a couple of weeks, a couple of months. It needs a long time, six months, a year plus, to really have the chance to show the impact that, that we really believe it can show. It's got to be given enough time for the muscles to build up over time to be able to show an, uh, an impact. What we're also stressing, and again, for both sides, expectations, but also with insurers, is we're, we're not just looking for increases over time. SMA, naturally, the natural history, what SMA does on its own when it's untreated is goes downhill. So any impact from a drug which changes from that, whether it's just slowing the progression down, stabilizing and staying steady, or increases, all of those are improvements. All of those should be covered in terms of making a decision of whether the drug's working for renewals. So that's the perspective that we would put out there. Um, another thing that we're really putting out is, you know, it, it is going to be um, really important to have good records of how things do change over time, giving it time, but, but looking at baseline to the year, two years later. And so there's definitely clinical data that will be collected formally, but we also recommend making sure you're keeping your own notes from how things were when you started to later on on treatment and videos, notes on any of those changes really should help as well. And then a lot of this is, is real world data that isn't just on an individual basis, that is something that we can pull together to again, show comparisons across the country to insurers of how things are changing and what the impact is. And so we always are, are now doing our annual membership survey where we collect your feedback on, on your current situation and how things are changing. We definitely put a plug in for that to please participate it helps us when we go into hospitals, insurers, to make the argument of, of why coverage is needed and why hospitals should be involved in this area. Uh, so I think the final thing I'll maybe say is a little more general and then we'll shift topics a little bit. I think one of the big themes that you're probably gonna hear on some of the other presentations as well is, is about time. And, and from a number of angles, we're giving therapies enough time to work. Um, and I think as well, when we're talking about a question that's gonna come up about treatment now versus trials versus things in the future, time is the really critical component. One of the things that you'll hear from Jill, I think, is about time is the most important thing rather than waiting for a future opportunity. It's really taking what's available now that is most important rather than potentially waiting six months to a year for something to happen. SMA is about motor neurons. It's about that loss and stopping that as soon as you can. Um, I think the other thing that from a general perspective to point out is um, remembering that a lot of the things that you'll hear and see in publications and from clinical trials is an average result. So when you're looking about expectations, what you can expect from a therapy on treatment, it's remembering that when you see a result in a clinical trial, it's an average over a lot of people. It's the best expectation of what to have, but really everybody should bear in mind there's a lot of variability about that. And the average itself probably isn't gonna be what you actually get. Some people do better than the average, some people do worse. And so again, that's an expectation when you hear a clinical trial result, things vary a lot about that. And so um, I think with that, we'll turn on to the next topic, where we'll just talk a little bit about it, some updates on the resources that we have available for the community. Great, thank you, Kenneth. Um, so this is Megan again. I'm just gonna run through a couple of resources that are available. All of these are available on our website, and so um, you will see on your screen links to where you can find each of these resources. Again, I wanna stress um, that we'll send this deck out to you after the webinar. So if you're not able um, to grab all these links right away, um, don't worry, we'll be providing that to you as well. Um, so the first thing that I'll cover is the site list. Kenneth uh, talked quite a bit about this. This is the 118 uh, confirmed sites that are available um, ready to publicly announce and ready to accept new patients. Um, and so I've listed here again where you can find this is curesma.org slash spinraza slash sites. Um, and what uh, you're going to find here is we've upgraded this page a little bit perhaps since the last time you've seen it. Um, and it now includes a search function. And so you can filter according to a specific state and you can also filter according to sites that are taking pediatric patients, sites that are taking adult patients, and then sites that are taking both. Um, another resource that we have made available um, is a dedicated web page 
to all drug programs that have either uh, are in clinical trials but have reached a pivotal trial stage or have gone through um, and been approved by the FDA. And so these uh, web pages are sort of just a, a nice single home, a little repository um, of all the information on those specific programs. That includes information about the treatment and how it works. Um, for those that are in pivotal stage, it's information on the current clinical trials. For um, treatments currently only Spinraza that have been approved by the FDA, you'll see updates on dosing sites and treatment access, links to past announcements on our news site, um, and just other resources that are going to be helpful. There are um, three specific programs that have reached this stage. So again, Spinraza, obviously, curesma.org slash Spinraza. Um, we also have a page for of access for gene therapy, and that's curesma.org slash avaccess101. Um, and then finally, for the RG7916 so, uh, module, this is the Genentech Roche a small molecule program. Um, if you're, you're not familiar with that, you might recognize the, the sunfish, firefish, jewelfish, all of those fish trials. Um, that's what uh, this is referring to. So again, the uh, specific links are on your screen, but we'll be sending these out after the presentation. Um, and then just a quick reminder about insurance coverage resources. And so the um, the policy uh, policies that Kenneth mentioned are on krsma.org slash Benraza. Um, look for the resources section, and then within resource, you'll see insurance policies. And so you can actually link to those specific policies um, and read them in more detail. Um, just also a reminder that we released um, an insurance booklet last year, and so it's called Choice and Connection to Care. And this does not get into sort of the very specifics of of Spinraza or, or any of those, but um, it's more kind of a generally about commercial versus government health options, um, how to make the decisions that are right for your family. And again, the link to that is on our web, or on, I'm sorry, the link to our website is on the slide as well. Um, and then finally, for those of you who are on Medicaid, um, or last year we released an update um, on how your congressperson's office can help um, how the caseworkers that are there can sort of help you navigate um, the Medicaid process. Perhaps you're getting pushbacks or denials. Um, the you know congressperson they represent you and they're there to help you. And so the link to that um, is also on your screen. Um, and then just finally, these are shifting a little bit to the other topics that Jill and Mary will speak about in a moment. Um, but we do have a list of currently recruiting trials on our website, curesma.org slash current trials. And then we also have resources on care and medical issues. That's where Mary will come in. Um, but the really nice thing here is in this section, uh, curesma.org support slash care, um, you'll be able to find information for you and for your family, um, but also resources for healthcare professionals that you can pass on to your doctor. Um, so again, I know I kind of ran through a bunch of links there, um, but we'll send this out after the presentation. Um, so our next topic is on current and upcoming clinical trials, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to Jill Jaraki, our Chief Scientific Officer. Hi, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about the current clinical trials, some upcoming clinical trials, and then have a brief discussion on combination therapies for SMA. So. Um, I want to start out by saying uh, Megan uh, mentioned a nice resource on our website for finding clinical trials. You can find very detailed information about each of these clinical trials at www.clinicaltrials.gov. And if you type in this clinicaltrials.gov identifier number that I provided there on the slide, you um, each of these uh, clinical trials will come up and you'll have detailed information about the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the trial and contact information for the different sites. So uh, please look at that information if you're interested in any of these trials. So currently in the US, we have a number of different trials ongoing for SMA. The first one listed here is for CK2127107. Um, this is a <clears throat> clinical trial sponsored by Cytokinetics. It is in teens and adults 12 years and older. Um, it is a phase two trial with 16 sites in the US, and it is testing 
a muscle drug for SMA, a drug that would enhance muscle function. The second set of clinical trials on this slide are three trials that Megan referred to already as firefish, sunfish, and jewelfish. These are um, testing the efficacy of a small molecule that uh, corrects SMN2 splicing, and these trials are sponsored by Roche. Um, and you may have uh, heard of this drug referred to as RG7916 uh, um, previously. <clears throat> so the first of this group of trials is called Firefish. It is an infant's age one through seven months with type 1 SMA. It is in the pivotal stage, um, meaning it can be used for FDA registration. And they have three sites currently in the U.S., in Palo Alto, Boston, and New York City. Uh, more could be coming online um, in the coming um, months. <clears throat> the second is the trial called Sunfish. It is in children, teens, and adults aged 2 to 25 with SMA type 2 or 3. It is a phase 2 trial. Um, it will roll over into a pivotal trial um, and sometime um, likely this year. It is primarily being run in Europe right now with no U.S. Um, sites currently. Uh, we expect that that could change or will change for the pivotal part of the trial. <clears throat> Finally, there is the trial um, called Jewelfish for RG7916. And this is for <clears throat> children, teens, and adults aged 12 to 60 who have previously been on an SMN2 targeting therapy. Um, so Spinraza, but there is a washout period. You cannot be on the two drugs concurrently. You would first have to wash out of the previous SMN enhancer you've been on and uh, go on to the new drug. And <clears throat> it has one site uh, at Columbia University in New York City. So next slide, please. So there are also um, two other trials. Both of these are gene therapy trials. Uh, assessing uh, Avexis 101 for um, SMA. The first one is the STRIVE trial. It is a pivotal uh, registration trial for infants with one or two copies of SMN2 less than six months of age. Um, patients must also have a swallowing evaluation test done prior to administration of the gene therapy. Uh, it is for 15 patients at 16 sites across the U.S. It is currently a rolling right now. There is also the second <clears throat> uh, gene therapy trial from Avexis. Uh, this is for um, <clears throat> children up to 60 months of age um, with three copies of SMN2 who develop symptoms at less than 12 months of age. Uh, they need to uh, have sat independently but not walked <clears throat> or been able to stand. It is a phase three trial. It will have 27 uh, subjects at 11 sites in the U.S. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so the next slide uh, discuss trials that we believe will open up in the coming year but are not yet recruiting. The first of these is from a new company in the SMS space called ScholarRock. They have a drug called SRK015. It's a myostatin inhibitor um, which will improve muscle, muscle strength. Uh, they have announced that they will have a safety trial in healthy volunteers, adult volunteers, um, by the, the end of the second quarter of 2018. And they have mentioned um, that they will begin proposed trials for SMA patients um, projecting by the end of 2018 uh, for two different populations, for those who have been on SMN upregulating therapies and also as a single therapy in certain other populations. Uh, right now, we don't know anything about sites uh, or inclusion, exclusion criteria or the number of patients. <clears throat> Avexis uh, has also announced three additional trials uh, for their gene therapy. The first would be a European version of the Curis clinical trial um, called STRIVE that we just discussed. <clears throat> the second would be a trial called SPRINT, which is a pre-symptomatic trial. It will be a one-time IV infusion of the gene therapy. It will be multinational. It will be in pre-symptomatic patients with SMA types 1, 2, and 3. It will involve 44 patients. Um, these patients can have two, three, or four copies of SMN2, 
and be less than six weeks of age and pre-symptomatic. <laughs> Finally, Avexis has announced that they will do a trial called REACH. Uh, it will be a one-time interfecal injection. It'll be multinational. They expect it to start in late 2018 or early 2019 with SMA types one, two, and three. There'll be 50 patients um, <clears throat> and they can be between six months and 18 years of age. Uh, not listed on this slide are some other trials that we uh, expect um, could uh, come up uh, sometime in the future, and these were um, alluded to in a community statement that Biogen put out today. Um, we don't have any details, names, sites, locations, but in that statement, um, <clears throat> Biogen mentioned that they are evaluating device collaborations to look at ways to um, administer to Spinraza to patients with spinal fusions. Uh, and so we anticipate that there could be some trials um, involved with that project um, in the months to come. And also they mentioned there that they are uh, planning, <clears throat> they have been working and supporting study proposals that can demonstrate the value of Spinraza in the teen and adult um, population. And in addition to that, they expect to collect data that could support the use of Spinraza in teens and adults through their SHINE extension study. So SHINE is a study where all the patients who were in the previous clinical trials for uh, Spinraza before its approval are continued to be monitored and data collected on them. And uh, those, that data can then be used um, uh, to support the use of Spinraza. Next slide, please. So, one of the issues that having other both an approved drug and clinical trial um, options out there is how do you decide what to do? And I think this is a very individualized um, decision, which has many factors and should be discussed um, in close consultation with your neurologist or physician. And some of the discussion points that would be important to have with your physician on deciding whether to go on an approved therapy or join a clinical trial would be to evaluate and understand the currently available safety and efficacy data, evaluate the possibility of a placebo. Placebos are very important in trials. And as we all know with Spinraza, they are often the quickest way to get a drug approval but it's important to understand um, whether there's a placebo or not. Small molecules often are more likely to have a placebo than other drug modalities, such as a biologic um, gene therapy. And also uh, type one uh, trials are probably less likely to have a placebo than other types of SMA. So this is something important to think about and make sure you understand um, before entering a trial. Um, you probably want to evaluate and understand the route and timing of administration. Is it a small molecule? Is it an intrathecal injection? Is it an IV infusion? Um, it's also very important to understand the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria is often obvious. The exclusion criteria is often um, uh, more subtle and things that you uh, should carefully check into. One of the important exclusion criteria is to make sure that you understand is whether previous drug exposure is allowed, how long that washout period is, um, because many trials have an exclusion um, criteria, particularly for other SMN2 enhancers. Um, and the reason for this is, is because to get FDA approval, say for a gene therapy, you have to show clinically significant benefit. And if you're already taking another SMN enhancer, 90% of that benefit may already be there. And adding something else on top of it may only give you 10% benefit. And it would be very hard to detect that. And that may prohibit FDA approval. Well, if you use the as a single SM enhancer alone, the new drug, you will in itself maybe be able to see that greater improvement, but you, in combination, that'll be very hard to detect. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the things that Kenneth alluded to is that timing is incredibly critical in SMA. 
particularly in the acute stage of the disease where you're, the patient is actively losing motor neurons. To date, we don't know of ways to replace lost motor neurons. So drugs, particularly SMN enhancers, will be most effective in preventing motor neuron loss. So it really is our recommendation not to wait for future trials to open if you have other options available now. The reason for this is that delays in trials are common and can't be predicted. This doesn't mean that the drug program is going off the rails. It's just normal in drug development. Um, changes in exclusion and inclusion criteria are common until formally announced. And um, as I said, earliest possible administration of SM enhancers yield the best results. So I think timing is one of the most critical considerations on deciding what drug to try in SMA. Next slide, please. So I think a lot of you have heard the messaging for a while that it's critical to cure SMA that we can help make sure that we have maximally effective treatments for all types and age stages and ages in SMA. And we believe that this may involve combination therapies and a cocktail approach. And this is one of our long-term strategic goals at Cure SMA to help develop combination therapies. Um, this involves going back and identifying non-SMN drug targets to be used for combination therapies, um, testing the efficacy of combination therapies at the preclinical stage in animal models, and then moving them on to clinical trials. Combination and therapies can involve other SMN enhancers, um, you know, things that uh, increase SMN2 splicing like Spinraza or RG7916, things that turn on the SMN gene, things that stabilize the SMN protein, things that replace the SMN gene like gene therapy, things that uh, restore muscle strength, or things that help motor neurons function better. Uh, this goal also involves as I said, um, optimizing SMN enhancing therapies for second and class drugs. Um, and that is important to do. Um, and all, most of our funding right now in basic and translational research is geared to this goal of finding combination therapies. Next slide, please. One of the things that we need to think about, though, is how to combine drugs. And this has to be done thoughtfully. Any two drugs not, cannot just be mixed together and expect to have good results. Um, a lot of drugs have different safety concerns when used together. And you have to make sure the benefit of using them together outweigh the risk. You really have to have evidence that they have additive clinical benefits. And you know, you're not just getting the same benefit taking one drug rather than two. You also have to make sure that drugs don't reduce the efficacy or availability of the other. For instance, um, some drugs will inhibit or promote the clearance of another drug from the body, so they don't make sense to use together. And can they be readily co-administered? Um, if you have a technically challenging administration of a drug, you have to think about that. I think. There's a lot of interest in our community right now about combining two SMN enhancers. And this is something we're all interested in doing, but I think there are a number of uh, questions that have to be asked preclinically or in clinical trials um, before there will be the regular use of combining two and SMN enhancers. One of them is, are SMN levels increased greater when you use the two drugs together versus alone? Um, and if they don't, you know, there may not be a rationale for using them together. And this typically means they would have to work by two different biological mechanisms, meaning putting two SMN2 splicing um, correctors together may not make sense in trying to get additive SMN levels. Uh, another option, will do they target different tissues, meaning that you get broader coverage across all cell types um, used together than alone? Do they work longer together than alone um, so that you have SMN upregulation occurring for uh, longer stretches of time when you are using them together? And I think if the answer isn't yes to one of these, the utility of testing particular combinations together might not be worth outweigh the risk. 
And that's something that I think um, is a challenge in developing combination therapies. Also, as I mentioned before, when you want to get FDA approval for a drug, you have to see a benefit. And that will be more challenging when using two drugs together, particularly um, when there are two SMN enhancers. So in many cases, ultimately the goal may be to use them in combination, but in the clinical trial realm, they may have to be tested uh, alone. Next. Great, thank you so much, Jill. Um, we're gonna turn it over um, to Mary Shrove in just a second. Um, I do wanna send a reminder, we've already received a lot of great questions, um, so please continue um, sending those in as soon as Mary's through her presentation, we will go ahead and take some of those questions. Um, but we have Mary Shrove on the line, she's our new Chief Medical Officer, and um, we've talked a lot about different treatments, but we know that it's treatments and care working together um, that's going to provide the best outcomes for those with SMA, and so we wanted to have Mary speak to the importance of care and some of the issues um, that need to be addressed out there. So, Mary? Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you, everybody. Great to be speaking with you. Uh, my role really is to remind you uh, that we cannot forget where we've come from and that we need to continue the basics. It is so exciting right now. We have so many new therapies. Um, uh, it's even more important now than ever to continue the care basics. For those who've used BiPAP, um, you need to continue to use BiPAP, a uh, cough machine, different secretion clearance techniques. Um, we're, we are all learning together the impact of these new therapies on breathing, swallowing, and nutrition. So I really want to emphasize that it's important to continue to also do those things that help. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're learning is that with uh, Spinraza therapy, some of our uh, centers are reporting that individuals receiving Spinraza may need more protein in their diet. When we're checking levels, um, they seem to be amino acid levels. Some of them are lower. Um, so please work with your dietitian, work with your healthcare team to help you uh, identify mm -hmm. continuing nutritional needs. We also want to uh, optimize the impact of these new therapies. Uh, so it's very important to pursue physical therapy treatment in addition to the assessments that are necessary to qualify for the treatment. So having someone assess and, and uh, provide ways to optimize uh, function are critically important. Next slide, please. We know that this has been a rough winter for everybody, and especially those with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And I just, again, want to remind you that it's really important to avoid others who are ill and good hand washing. Those are the two primary ways that we avoid illness. Uh, I'm also recommending that everyone get their influenza vaccine. Uh, the CDC is recommending that if you haven't received an influenza vaccine, that it's still of value to receive that. And we recommend that you get the flu shot every year and also keep up routine, routine immunizations. Also very important is to have an illness plan with your physician. What will you do when you start to get sick? What is your treatment strategy? What is the secretion clearance plan? Um, and push fluids. Um, and I am happy to talk to your healthcare providers if they're willing to talk with me. So please have them contact me if they have any questions about the best ways to do management. Thank you. So back to me again. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and um, take some questions now. Again, please continue sending um, those in during the question and answer period. We have about uh, 15 minutes here to cover questions. Um, so I'm gonna give the first one to Jill. Um, and, and Jill, in the interest of time, I'm gonna try to consolidate a couple of questions into one. Um, so as you might imagine, and as you uh, talked about in your presentation, there's a lot of interest on whether those who are currently taking Spinraza are going to be eligible for current or upcoming clinical trials. Um, and I think you, you mentioned three different trials that have three different approaches um, to eligibility, which is the REACH study um, for Avaxis, the Jewelfish study for the Genentech Roche small molecule, and then the SRK015 trial. Um, so if you could just kind of review um, the, the three separate approaches those trials represent to current Spinraza use and what that means for our community. 
So right now, uh, there are no clinical trials open where you can use beyond Spinraza and be in the clinical trial. There are a number of them where you could wash out of Spinraza for a certain amount of time, um, like jewelfish, and then go on the trial. Uh, for the current gene therapy trials, you cannot have been on Spinraza to participate in those trials. Uh, and I think that generally it could be challenging for drugs that are uh, both SMN enhancers to be uh, tested together in the same clinical trial. Um, for other drug options, things that affect muscle strength and motor neuron strength, I think that's a much more uh, feasible possibility. Um, and as you heard, um, the muscle drug uh, from Scholar Rock is they have at least put out the um, proposition that they will test their drug in combination with Spinraza. So I'll just jump in with a, a few quick items as well. It's maybe reiterating a couple of things that, as Jill was saying, so one thing we would definitely be recommending is not waiting to go on a current treatment and not stopping in a current treatment for the potential chance of getting into a future trial. Again, it's that time issue that is the most important thing. And then the other thing, maybe a, different, a bit of a different spin on what Jill's saying, we, we are seeing these different approaches on whether you can be on uh, current treatment spin rather, or you can wash out, or you can't have either of those going on. And I think some of the things that you see there is, if a drug's working in a very similar way, then the chances are it's probably not gonna be tested together. If uh, drugs are delivered with very similar routes of administration, you know, definitely kind of the intrathecal approach, again, it's gonna be unlikely that they're gonna be tested together. But on the other hand, I think if drugs work in different ways, very different ways, and there you can see an SMN enhancer with a muscle therapy, there are some chances to actually have them at the same time. And then the other angle also is if a drug has kind of a quick washout period, if it's a pill, if it doesn't stay in the body for a long time, that again, in some way, kind of minimizes some of the risks about doing things together. So that then gives the chance to actually combine at the same time. So I think the, the take home message is that unless the trial organizers have specifically said that it would be in combination or that prior Spinraza use would be okay, that our community should assume Spinraza is going to be an exclusion criteria for that trial. And, you know, I think there's a lot of questions, so we are reiterating this a little bit, but, you know, our recommendation would be that the expectation should be that the gene therapy trials, you won't be allowed to be on Spinraza, and you will not be allowed to have had previous exposure to Spinraza either for those future gene therapy trials. So let me ask a follow-up question, and maybe, Jill, I'll also put this one to you first. Um, so um, some have raised the issue that, you know, there is an effective treatment available in Spinraza. SMA type 1 is particularly critical. Um, and so if these trial organizers are prohibiting people from being on Spinraza, how do they plan to conduct trials in the SMA type 1 population? So I think that, you know, that's why making the decision to go on to a clinical trial is a serious discussion that you need to have with your physician and your neurologist because uh, with an experimental drug, uh, there are not proven benefit or efficacy. So this is a very important thing to think about when you're moving forward um, and making that decision to go into an experimental therapy versus uh, being on an approved drug. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll maybe throw this one out to Kenneth first. Um, so we also got a lot of questions about um, adult inclusion in trials um, and then also types three and four um, being included in trials. And so what is the status of adult inclusion in trials? And then um, specifically at CareSMA, what are we doing to advocate um, for broader inclusion in trials? So one aspect is that we strongly advocate for approvals for all ages and all types. So that's something that's kind of behind clinical trials, but it's, it's something that we're always pushing for, especially when you're looking at kind of the SMN enhancing therapies with the genetics of SMA. Drugs should work across the spectrum of ages and types. And so that's something that we're always pushing for. Um, when you look at the actual trials themselves, it, it gets a little bit more um, subtle with what's the right approach to actually do the trials to get that full approval. 
And I think this is something that we saw with Spinraza, with those trials, that if you can get broad approval without doing an awful lot of trials with a lot of different groups, you can actually get there quicker. And so that's one of the considerations that what's the best way to conduct trials that will give you the quickest approval for all, a quick, broad approval. And so I think that the thing that you're, we're always looking at with adult trials is that generally they're going to take longer. The disease is moving at a slower pace. And so to see the big change that you need to see in a clinical trial to get approval is going to take longer with an adult trial. And so sometimes it's quicker to do trials in other groups. And that's what actually played out with Spinraza. Um, of course, I think what we know now as well is that there's approval, and we did get it with Spinraza for a broad label, then there's coverage, and it's what do you need to do to actually get the coverage as well with payers for all ages and all types and adults. And that's something which, you know, is in, you know, is kind of the key topic, I think, for us right now as well. So there, I think it's looking at, can you use the same data that works with the FDA with payers? And there, I think you'll, if you look at kind of that chart, we, we have been successful that some of the payers are covering adults based on the trial data, but it's not across the board. So that's an area where additional data is needed to make the argument to show this therapy is also valuable. It's also, you know, has efficacy and it has a, has a valuable imp impact to adults. So what we're doing there and what other groups are doing, um, Biogen as well, um, hospitals across the country are collecting more data. And I think there's ways to be involved in that. We're collecting your data, which you can give to us, so the patient-entered information, that annual survey again. If we can collect data from adults that says what your current situation is, what's meaningful to you, for those people who are on therapy, what you're seeing, we can then take that data in and help on the coverage part. I think as well, there's plans in, in the works right now to do additional studies and trials that would collect clinician-entered information. And so that's actual clinical trials that would you know, collect data from hospitals that can then be used in publications and with payers to help get that broader coverage where it's needed. Um, and then finally, something that we're getting ready to launch is a broader network, which isn't about controlled clinical trials, but collecting real world data. And I think, again, that's something which is important here, that there are adults on therapy now. Um, there are adults that are approved on drug and, and getting results that are coming through. So how do we collect that real world data now, outside of clinical trials, into a, a clinician-entered registry that then again gives us that evidence to go to payers, much more than regulators, and make sure that we're getting coverage. Great. And if I can just um, put in a little added plug for something that Kenneth mentioned in his answer, um, which is our annual community update survey. Um, the 2018 version of that is going to come out um, within the next several weeks, and we recently um, released a compass issue that talked about the results we saw from the 2017 survey. Um, so if you go to curesma.org slash news, um, just maybe scroll back a little bit. Um, again, just in the last week or two, we put out um, a report on the 2017 survey, and please be on the lookout for the 2018 survey, which will be coming up in the next couple weeks. Um, let me ask this next question, and I'll, uh, Kenneth and Mary, I'll let both of you speak on this. Um, I'll go to Mary first. Um, so what is the status on a treatment delivery for those with spinal fusion? So actually, I think Kenneth was going to take that first. Well, you, do you want to Mary first? I was talking on the other one. Sure. So um, there's a lot of centers that are providing uh, alternatives to doing direct intrathecal delivery. Um, People are exploring different reservoirs and different sort of implantable devices uh, for individuals um, to see if we can do that. I, I know that there are different centers approaching this from a variety of perspectives, and we don't have one answer yet. We have multiple uh, strategies to, uh, to, to figure this out. Um, many people are, many centers are using interventional radiology to uh, to deliver drug um, in those who have uh, uh, fusions uh, and are doing preliminary scans to figure out whether they have an access point. Um, and then using the interventional, radiology, uh, interventional radiologist to do that. And then, so that's one approach. Another approach is the implantable devices that I had just mentioned previously. Um, there's great interest in exploring um, in exploring these devices, uh, and there have been investments in uh, in developing a clinical trial to look at that. 
And so the one thing I'll just add there is the same as with adults. I think what we're seeing is there are people out there that are going through these procedures, devices, reservoirs that are actually getting put in right now. We need to collect that real world data. That can be used again to, you know, not, not so much maybe the coverage, but working with other hospitals, make sure that there's a standard protocol for how to go about this and make other hospitals and sites comfortable with the process. And then there are things in the works that are, are, are developing right now about doing more of the, the, the trials and studies to do it in a more um, controlled way and, and get the data out from actually clinical studies as opposed to just real world data. Um, okay, so I will uh, give this question to perhaps Jill first and then to Kenneth. Um, so this is, I'm 63 and just had my second loading dose of Spinraza. Um, the question is, will I regain most of my strength from the treatment? I think if you look at the CHERISH data that was published today in the New England Journal of Medicine, you will see um, that patients who received Spinraza did regain strength on average. They gained about four points on the Hammersmith scale. But I think it's important to keep in mind that there are uh, 64 ice points that can be gained on the Hammersmith scale. And so people are gain and each of the, and I think it's um, something like 32 to 33 items. And so people are on average gaining two of those items um, on when they're on drug. So you will regain some strength, but not all of your strength. And I also, but that's on average, as Kenneth said, and um, for each individual patient, you could gain more or less than the average, and that probably depends on a variety of factors, such as uh, how old you are, what type of SMA you have, and what secondary complications of the disease um, might also be present. And probably not adding too much more, but I think you know the message there, I think, would be the right expectation would be you, you won't be regaining all of your loss functions, but Hopefully, if you kind of match up to the average, it would be stopping further progression, um, staying stable, and maybe some increases, but not back to kind of regra regaining everything that you had. I think a lot of what we hear with adults is sometimes some increases in strength, but, but the big kind of in, the, the big feedback that we hear is um, improvements in endurance, less fatigue, making it through the day with normal activities you've been doing, but doing them for longer rather than lots of you know, big increases in strength. I think that's what we see. Great. Um, so, Jill, perhaps um, probably put this question to you first. Um, so, we have a question about aloxamy. Um, we went through several different trials of several different treatments. This is a treatment that was at one point um, in a later stage trial, and um, the qu question is if we have an update on this program as well. So, no, we're not ex sure of the exact status of the development plan um, for that drug at this time. I think the only thing to add, just what Jill is saying right now, right now there's nothing active, there's no trials that are going on. I think there might be an extension trial for people that were in the earlier trial right now so that they can keep um, having access to the therapy. But as far as we know, there's, there's no plans to reinitiate any trials in that area with that therapy right now. Uh, we have one minute left. I'm going to try to squeeze two questions into this last minute. Um, so, Kenneth, I'll give you this one. Um, so, you mentioned towards the beginning of your presentation that there are about 100 sites out there that are dosing but are not ready to publicly announce this. Um, the question is if there's anything we can do as a community to hopefully get these additional 100 sites to announce publicly and open up their doors. Um. I think there is. I think we can probably make sure there's some information on our website available for you to advocate to, with these hospitals, um, and we'll maybe even try and include it with this webinar. I think anything that can be done at the local level to encourage these hospitals to participate in webinars, and in particular the conference that we're going to have in June, that would be good. And we've got postcards, flyers to invite people to these, these um, opportunities. And I think it is. It's, it's encouraging, advocating for these hospitals to get engaged with our community learn more, get training from us. Um, there is support, there's funding that we're giving to these sites as well and in certain areas and certain kind of training with physical therapists and things like that that we're, we're, we have resources available too. 
So I think it's, it's advocating, trying to make sure these hospitals, the healthcare professionals there are engaged with us. Awesome. Um, we have one question, which I thought was a great question to end on, and I'll actually take this one. Um, so the question is, um, how can I help more in these issues? You know, what sort of can I do? Um, and so I think there are four action points that we would really encourage everyone to take. Um, the first is just to keep us informed. Um, you know, give us a call, send us an email at info at um, If you have experiences, insurance denials, um, those sorts of things, let us know. Let us know what's happening. Let us know what you're hearing. Because um, as we kind of collect these stories, we can start to see trends develop. And if you hear of meetings, um, hospitals looking for kind of groups to come in, um, the Medicaid programs, things like that, often are looking for groups to come in and give testimony. Let us know. We can help you and actually go into those, but we can also bring other professionals, clinicians into those meetings as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you're specifically interested in being an advocate, you want to put your name out there and say, hey, if there's an opportunity in my area to give testimony, um, send us an email at advocacy at kirasame.org and we'll get you on our list. Um, we also have a newly released um, advocacy action center. It's kirasame.org slash action center. Um, and that, you know, and there's specific opportunities and this relates to treatment access, but also relates um, to things like federal funding, newborn screening, sort of any sort of action that we're taking. Um, this is where you can find it. It will give you a suggested message, um, you know, all those sorts of good things. And then finally, just another plug um, for the upcoming community survey. Um, what we want to do is build this up and so that, you know, as each, each year is brought in, we can see what the changes are over time in our community with these treatments and trials. Um, and be able to share that data with regulators, payers, and all of these groups that we're advocating with. Um, so on your screen, you've got just a couple reminders and ways to get in touch with us. Um, thank you all so much for your time, um, and we look forward to the next time we'll have one of these webinars.